Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Suzanne Goldberg. I'm Executive Vice President for University Life here at Columbia. I'm so glad to see so many people here tonight. And I want to welcome you on behalf of the Office of University Life and also on behalf of 60 or perhaps more at this point, co-sponsors from around the university, student organizations from nearly every school, uh, administrative bodies, schools, and, and more, centers and institutes from across the university. If you haven't already, I'd ask and encourage you to take a look at the co-sponsorship list. Uh, as uh, Alondra Nelson and I were saying, I, we don't think there's been an event at Columbia that has had such broad co-sponsorship as this one tonight, at least not in recent memory. Uh, so I, I want to uh, thank our speakers as well. Um, I'm going to, I shouldn't stand in front of them. I will introduce them all in a moment. Uh, and because we want to get the conversation started quickly, I just want to say a, a, a th two or three quick points right now. Um, the first is, again, that I'm so glad so many people are here. Um, I know in my own work, I have been working on these issues for some time, and I don't think a couple of years ago, if we had hosted this gathering, we would have as many people in the room. And I think it's, it's particularly important because we have a pivotal moment, and it's a moment that I think, to, with the frustration that many people feel, with the anger that many people feel, and also with the energy that so many people feel, we have an opportunity to take this pivotal moment and make it one of sustained transformation. And it's really an, a great opportunity tonight to be together and move in that direction. Second, and this comes from my own personal as well as institutional focus on sustained change. I want to mention just three uh, points of action going forward after tonight's meeting because I know many of us over the years have been in many conversations and wondered after we leave, well, what happens and will anything happen and, and how to keep the conversation, not only the conversation, but also action moving forward. So let me just mention three. The first is, and many of you may not know, the Office of University Life was first uh, started last January by President Bollinger, and he asked me to lead it. When he did, he also asked me to convene a group to focus on issues of race, ethnicity, and justice, and diversity and inclusion more broadly. We started that last year when the office was, was still brand new, uh, meeting with some people in the room as well as some uh, students and others, or students who have since graduated. And we, now what, I, what my, our plan now going forward is to take the work from the working group, which is always, as we do in my office, work with students, faculty, and administrators together, and formalize it into a task force on inclusion and Col at Columbia. What I will be doing, what my office will be doing, it's a small office still, um, very soon is getting up on the Office of University Life website, a forum through which you can express interest to be part of the task force. And I encourage as many people who want to work on this issue in a forward going way to uh, take a look and, and get involved. The office website, by the way, is just universitylife.columbia.edu. Um, so that's one, and I, and I guess I should say one other thing quickly about the office. Re there are, there's a lot to say, but one thing I want to say in particular is that the office is focused on the university as a whole and on thinking about the university as community. Student life issues across the schools, intellectual life conversations that we have at the university level, and issues of community citizenship particularly. And I think tonight's gathering kind of encapsulates in many ways all three of those. So that's one, uh, the task force on inclusion at Columbia. The second is that there is already a space on the University Life website called Ideas in Action. And the idea of that space is to create a space for digital conversation that can take place before and after in-person events. So we've hosted through my office with many co-sponsors, again, a few events on awakening our democracy. More will come next semester. But you'll see on that web page uh, an, an invitation to share your ideas. And I would encourage you to share them in writing and photographically. And there will be an opportunity for us to put the ideas up on the web page as well as circulate them out through social media. Uh, the third, and I just want to uh, uh, mention, uh, sorry, briefly, uh, is to, sorry, I'm working on cold medicine as well, um, 
is just to say that there is ongoing work that has been taking place at the administrative and faculty levels for some time. And tonight is, an, is a piece of that, obviously, with this office helping con to convene this conversation. But much more uh, has been going on and will go on going forward. I just want to mention one in particular that people may not yet be aware of. There is a center on teaching that is new at Columbia. One of the programs that that center has been featuring since it started were se our sessions for faculty and graduate student teaching assistants on creating an inclusive classroom. And particularly since we'll be talking in part tonight about microaggressions, I wanted to flag that work of that center for you. Uh, here's the final point. Right, universities, as I think all of us know, can be tremendously challenging places, individually, uh, in socially, intellectually, collectively, in, in really all dimensions. There's another aspect of universities that's all, that I think is also tremendously important, and that is that they invite us to imagine the possible. Right? They challenge us and invite us in a space to think about what can our world look like. I was at a university lecture recently where a faculty member was talking about teaching and learning and he asked the question, what would it be, what would it be like if we could learn anything we wanted? And that's really for me a question tonight is what would it be like, a question that I think is our, our collective question. What it, would it be like to imagine a university and a broader society in which issues of discrimination and bias and hostility and violence based on race, based on ethnicity, and based on so many other aspects of identity were not part of our world, right? What would it be like to imagine that? And then secondarily, because it's not only imagination but also action, what steps might we take to get there? And so I invite you as you're listening to the conversation tonight and as you're participating in the speak out to think about that as well if, if, if that engages you. So now it's my honor and privilege to introduce our panelists and I'm only going to introduce them very briefly by titles. I want to ask and encourage you to Google them uh, later, not during the conversation, because they're all doing and have done tremendous work in this area. So Alondra Nelson, Professor and Dean Alondra Nelson is our moderator tonight. Alondra Nelson is the Dean of Social Science and uh, a professor, sorry Alondra, I know what your title is actually. <laughs> I just want to get it precisely right. Dean of Social Science and Professor of Sociology and Gender Studies in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Next to Alondra is Desmond Upton Patton. Desmond is an assistant professor of social work and has recently arrived at Columbia from the University of Michigan. So welcome. Uh, next to Desmond is my colleague at Columbia Law School, Susan Sturm. And Susan's title is the, jo Susan is the George M. Jaffin Professor of Law and Social Responsibility and the founding director of the Center for Institutional and Social Change at Columbia Law School. Next to Susan is Nisi Aya. Nisi's a Columbia College senior, and we thank you for your leadership on the panel as, as a college student tonight, and a former president and artistic director of the Black Theater Ensemble, which is a theater troupe dedicated to voices of color on the stage and telling narratives of the marginalized. Next to Nisi is Devon Wade. Devon's a doctoral student in the Department of Sociology in Columbia and on the board of the Student of Color Alliance and an advisor to Columbia's Men of Color Alliance. Uh, next to Devon is Dr. Hilda Hutcherson. Uh, Dr. Hutcherson, sorry, I guess I've been going by first name, so I'll just be informal for the moment with you too, if that's okay. Uh, Hilda, Dr. Hutcherson. Uh, is Senior Associate Dean for Diversity and Multicultural Affairs at the College of Physicians and Surgeons, which if you don't know what that is, it's the medical school. Um, <laughs> there's among the many uh, acronyms that are uh, different names that don't necessarily correspond to what you know at the university. Uh, Dr. Hutcherson is, a Nash is uh, Assistant De Asso Senior Associate Dean for Diversity and Multi Multicultural Affairs at the medical school and a nationally renowned expert in the field of women's health. Roosevelt Montes, next, next to Dr. Hilda Hutcherson, is Associate Dean of Academic Affairs at Columbia College and Director of the College's Center on the Core Curriculum. And next to Roosevelt is Melinda Aquino, Associate Dean of Multi Multicultural Affairs for Columbia College and the School of Engineering. And I will turn it over now to Alondra. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you so much.
So thank you all very much for coming. I know you're, we're all incredibly busy, but this is um, an urgent conversation. It's a conversation we need to have if we're going to live in beloved community and the sort of phrasing of the civil rights movement. Um, so thank you very much for coming, and I hope that we'll have a rich conversation. The first part of the conversation will be the teaching facet. So what people are going to talk from their various standpoints and their kind of intersectional places in the world about um, the context that brings us to this moment. Um, and then there'll be the speak out where we'll speak our second hour where we'll hear from you and we'll um, have a conversation <laughs> about um, precisely what Suzanne suggested, what the Columbia, our Columbia might look like, um, uh, um, a better Columbia might look like. Um, before uh, we begin, I just have a set of questions that I'll ask the panelists. I wanted to um, thank and acknowledge Suzanne because um, those of you who've been to Columbia for a few years know this is a very decentralized place. So the work of coordinating people from across schools, across divisions, um, and all of these student groups and the like is tremendous work. And you've, you know, your office, Lamar, uh, Lamar Lovelace, who pulled this together and, you know, 72 hours. It was a lot of work to get a lot of busy people here. So um, thank you for your, your leadership. It's really tremendous. So in the last week and in the last couple of years, we've had you know, students impassioned clarion um, about their dissatisfaction with their campuses. And this has taken place in the context of uh, you know, a larger sort of dis societal dis-ease about what's happening um, in elementary schools in South Carolina when little girls can be snatched up, um, what's happened with Trayvon Martin and Sandra, B B with Sandra Bland and um, Tanisha McBride and Eric Garner. So there's a large are both, um, you know, there's higher education, there's elementary schools, and there's a larger sort of societal, these concentric circles um, happening all at the same time. Um, and uh, although we want to imagine that you come to Columbia and you can just be here and concentrate on your studies, we are citizens, we're citizens of the world, and we are Columbia University in New York City, and um, and so there's there's more that, that must be done, and there's more that we're responsible for doing. Um, so um, to begin, Desmond, I wanted to ask you to, um, I guess, reflect on this moment through your work, um, and more particularly to ask you about, you were at Michigan, the University of Michigan before here, where you had been involved in some work on campus around mac microaggressions, and then more generally, your work um, as a scholar is about racial inequality, but particularly about youth violence and about trauma and how that affects higher education achievement. So um, we wanted to start with you as a to, to frame things. Thank you so much, Dean Nelson, and for the opportunity to uh, talk with you all this evening. Um, um, as uh, Suzanne mentioned, I am new to Columbia, so this is my first event talking to people. So um, be careful <laughs> with me <laughs> as I do this. Um, but I am not new to structural racism and issues of microaggression, so I have a lot to say about that. Um, I joined the faculty at Michigan um, right at the um, at a critical point where diversity was at an all-time low and the BBUM movement, being black at the University of Michigan hashtag, had just initiated. Um, but what's so interesting for me is that having been an, an alum of Michigan, the um, experiences that were uh, narrated on Twitter were not new to me, and they're actually quite triggering. So I'm this brand new minted PhD, I'm at Michigan, and I finally feel like I can do something about the, the things that are happening on campus. And so one of the things that I was able to do while I was at Michigan was to work uh, with students, which I think is extremely important, uh, on an action on race. So we brought together uh, faculty and students and staff to talk about the issues that were happening um uh, particularly in the School of Social Work. And from that event, um, two action items were uh, produced and we were able to move on one of them quite quickly. And that was to really do a study, a deep dive of microaggressions that are happening in the School of Social Work. We really wanted to understand the um, black student experience um, at the School of Social Work. And our findings were quite uh, disheartening, but not new, and probably not new to many of you. Um, one of the things we found is that the classroom experience can be a traumatic experience for black students. Um, black students were tired of going to class and uh, being called on to represent their entire race or people making assumptions about their family demographic or their socioeconomic status. These particular uh, traumatic experiences had an impact on their ability to 
to focus on class. So their cognitive resources were uh, quickly depleted as they had to figure out how to navigate their classroom experience, their field experience in the university more broadly, but also outside of the university, having to deal with being black outside of the university. So we're constantly bombarded with these daily assaults. And so they uh, were tired of this, as they should have been. And so we really wanted to help them think through ways to uh, um, work on some of these issues. And so one of the things that we really wanted to do, one of the things I promote, is really moving beyond safe space talking and thinking about brave spaces. How can we challenge each other to really talk about these issues in clear and critical ways um, that may hurt your feelings? Because sometimes my experience as a black male may hurt your feelings, or the things that I have to say may not come out so nicely. And for people to be accepting about that in an intellectual space. Um, to also think very critically and, and to really consider um, training for faculty around issues of microaggressions that happen in the classroom uh, and, and being able to, f to facilitate really tough conversations. What does it mean to be able to do that and how we do that well? Um, we also need to think about sustainability. So as of most of you are, I'm sure you're tired of the same conversations. I'm sure you're tired of the next meeting. Um, we have to figure out ways to move this beyond past your graduation. And that means we need a diverse place to be in. We need to be in spaces where uh, our faculty are diverse, our students are diverse, our policies and, and programming are diverse as well. And so we need that to sustain past your four years or your two years or if you're a PhD student, however many years you have here. Uh, that is extremely important. But uh, most importantly, uh, we need you to, to not give up and to really stay committed to this and to be, um, to be in an environment that allows you to voice your opinions um, and, to, and, and, and for those uh, opinions to be listened to and heard out. Thank you. Um, so we'll turn to Susan next, but I just want to, I feel like we should have a whiteboard here. I want to put brave space on the wall and like have us have a conversation about what that looks like and how that, how that, how we practice that, you know, we can talk more about that. So Susan, so you're founder and director of the Center for Institutional and Social Change at the law school here at Columbia. And you focus on building what you call, and I'll quote, the architecture of full participation in your work. So um, based on your longtime study of higher education, what are the obstacles to full participation? of students of color at colleges and universities, and how can they be overcome? Oh, thank you, Alondra. And I just also want to express such um, excitement uh, and also hope uh, for, the for the size of the group and the urgency. Uh, it's a real moment of real challenge, and I also sense something very different right now, uh, even as we're in this incredible time of struggle. Um, so first of all, just to say what do I mean by full participation, think about full participation as focused on building settings where people of all different races, genders, classes, backgrounds can enter, succeed, thrive, fail and recover, and contribute to the thriving of others. Uh, and I've looked at this issue both in my own teaching at the law school, uh, working uh, with many students and many students of color, uh, and also, interestingly, at two types of institutions that look like they're really different, but need to be brought together and um, face with people, there are some similar and related challenges. One set of institutions are uh, elite schools, uh, like uh, the Yale Law Journal, uh, Harvard Business School, uh, and uh, a group of liberal arts colleges. Uh, and uh, I've also looked at the same questions of full participation at community colleges in the South Bronx uh, and among students who are uh, formerly incarcerated and are really interested and eager to become members of um, higher education institutions and beyond. And so part of what I've, I've heard is, first of all, there's a relationship between some of the overinvestment in prestige at the top and the underinvestment in resources and success among struggling institutions. And that those, those two conversations need to be brought together really importantly. Um, secondly, uh, in this research which really asks people, students, uh, what is it 
like to enter this institution and try to, um, to move through it, succeed and thrive. Um, and uh, so one of the things that we hear over and over again among particularly the students in elite institutions, students of color, is that they come into the institution and experience their identity much more profoundly and in a much more day-to-day -day way than any place they've ever been before. Uh, and that that comes up in, in part because of interactions both with peers and with faculty that make students feel like their legitimacy is being questioned. Do they actually belong? in the institution. Uh, and uh, those types of interactions uh, also uh, stem in part from not having relationships with people with various kinds of, to use the phrase, to social capital, who are really invested in reaching out and investing in the success of students of color uh, and, uh, and in, in some institutions as women as well. Uh, and that's particularly true for students who are not coming from privileged backgrounds. Uh, and so part of what we also heard is that while race is very, very salient day in and day out, that race is also a very complex category. And people of, of, uh, of color at Yale Law School, whose both of parents were lawyers and who went to Yale undergraduate, uh, and um, have lots of friends and family in the profession are in a very different position uh, than students of color who come, uh, first generation college students coming from schools that have never sent anybody to a place like Yale before. Uh, also, very importantly, heard a uh, very different narrative but similar tracking narrative among um, students at Hostos that, you know, what, what is expected for them? What types of challenges uh, can they actually hope to take on and what types of investment will there be in their future and in their success? Uh, the last thing I just want to flag before we talk about well, some exciting possibilities is I heard a lot in both of these places about how conversations about these issues tend to take place among people who agree with each other, uh, people who are like each other. Uh, and the people who need to be part of the conversations where we're really grappling with these issues are not in the room. Uh, and that the spaces where these conversations take place tend to be spaces that people experienced as highly performative and polarizing. So some of the people who have very complex and subtle and important experiences really don't have a way to communicate with people who need to be part of those conversations if you're actually going to transform the institutional settings in which people are. So there's a real thirst for really building opportunities inside and outside the classroom uh, that take the leadership and experiences of students uh, which are not adequately valued uh, in, inside the classroom um, and build genuine intellectual, political, activist experiences and to do that in a way that will somehow get to the table people who might not be in this room right now uh, but need to be part of the conversation. So how has that been done? I mean, interestingly, the place where I've had the most kind of Transparency, rigor, and excitement about revealing what's not working has been, not surprisingly, an organization run by students. So the Yale Law Journal is run by students. Uh, and I can say that if it weren't, uh, I don't think the report that we prepared that reveals lots of issues and challenges would have been published. But the students said, look, this is an issue, this is a problem, we want to be transparent, invested a lot of time and energy and started really thinking not only about why aren't people of color participating on this journal, why aren't they in leadership positions, but also what is it about us? Not just why we're not including, but how are we running ourselves that we're missing uh, the, the value uh, of uh, socially engaged scholarship that would actually address pressing issues of uh, race, of inequality. And so that openness to both reveal what is actually going on, what are those patterns, and how do we bring people together around a conversation that's both about race and about participation based on race, but also about how the institution itself needs to be transformed, both to include people of color and also to actually fulfill its public mission. And I think that's a potential way to connect not only among those who are already in the room, 
but among people who uh, really need to hear this and need to hear both the courageous conversations, the challenging conversations, but also why this is a miner's canary, to use Lonnie Guineer's phrase, that these are issues that are both deeply experienced by, by students of color, by people of color, but are really about uh, are higher education institutions fulfilling their mission? How do they need to be rethought? How do we support the host doses so they have the resources like the Columbias and really build bridges between uh, the communities of color that are really struggling because of the disinvestment that's been taking place for decades? So Devon, I'm gonna come to you next. So I, I wanna just say something personal. Four or five years ago, a young man from Louisiana came to New York City and he was a Marshall Scholar and all these schools were trying to recruit him. And um, you know, the Department of Sociology didn't then have a track record of having students of color, although we do now. We now have several cohorts of, of students of color. And you know, I, I and, and others in the department said, take a chance on us. This is a place where you can flourish, right? And so, you know, but I know that, that, that there's been challenges. So thank you for coming. Some of the challenges is that, you know, not only is Devon, you know, part of the Student of Color Alliance, he helped found it. Not only is Devon part of the Men of a Color Alliance at Columbia, he helped found it. And he's doing all of this in addition to doing all of his work. So I'm deeply appreciative of you taking the time to do this, and I'm so proud of you. And so I want to ask you, um, you know, as, a, as my student, as a sociologist, as a soon-to-be professor, um, you have a particular vantage and intersectional position. What are the hurdles that you face to your flourishing in these roles? Because I want you, if no one else in this room wants you to flourish, I want you to flourish. And how can we make that happen? And what does your experience as a, and, uh, in your research suggest are the main hurdles to institutional change on this campus and elsewhere? And what ideas would you suggest for addressing these hurdles? So thank you so much for um, introducing me, Alondra. Um, it's been a great experience, and I think that I'm going to speak a bit to the challenges um, more than I speak to the affirmations, although like my experience here at Columbia has been um, has had its great moments. Um, but I do think that I want to pay attention to the students that are in the room and highlight um, those issues, particularly as a, as a graduate student. Um, and then having the kind of unique perspective of um, not only being a student, but also working in administration here, so I advise um, the men of color and work in the Office of Multicultural Affairs. Um, so as a sociologist, um, and having been here for almost five years, um, as a graduate student, um, I would argue that a lot of the uh, issues that we're seeing now um, stem from the organizational structure and culture of Columbia at, um, at this institution. Um, it seems to be a lot, and I think it was alluded to earlier, a, a very kind of decent decentralized space. Um, so you have these kind of disparate spaces and colleges um, all across campus and they don't seem to kind of come together um, in a um, in a way in which you know is, is productive and useful for um, the university but particularly for the most marginalized students um, who are in all spaces across campus. Um, and it seems to be that there are pockets of uh, action happening in these separate spaces at the institution that does not um, get extrapolated. And I I know this from my experience of I've worked in the Office of Multicultural Affairs for about three years, and we see um, a quite robust um, programming and um, events, et cetera, for the Office of Multicultural Affairs. Um, however, uh, the past year uh, or last year, um, a, a collective of graduate students of color got together and we organized around creating a more sustainable, um, inclusive um, Office of Multicultural Affairs, which practically from a lot of the perspectives of students of color in the graduate school of arts and science didn't exist. Um, and so in places like Columbia College and SEAS where you have these robust um, programs or offices around multicultural affairs or if you think about Teachers College, um, that, that these types of models for diversity programming and offices exist but they seem to exist in pockets and so when students fight back whether it's at CCs or SEAS or TC, things get done in those spaces, but that they aren't like extrapolated to to the or extrapolated or adopted across um, schools that Columbia 
have. Um, so I see that as a, as a huge problem, and I think one of the ways in which that could be addressed is a centralized office of diversity, which we don't have. And I, I think that one of the um, issues that I brought up uh, over the years um, is that, particularly around the issues of, of Black History Month, um, that there's this, there are all of these types of programs that are kind of going on. Um, I know of particularly like the ones that are going on in the Office of Multicultural Affairs, but the university as a whole is not, there isn't like this kind of centralized program where students can kind of go and do these things. So I think that, you know, there are pockets of action that are, that are happening um, in spaces, but that, that doesn't, you know, um, happen like across the university and students get left out. Um, <clears throat> more importantly, or I think one of the other obstacles that I've witnessed as a, as a graduate student has been um, there seemed to be a culture at Columbia um, of placing um, the onus of change on students um, at, at the institution. And so from, from my experience, no, I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, from my experience of being both on the administrative uh, side and the student side, um, we tell students who um, that if they want to see change, they must fight for it, even if we know in our heart from our experiences or whether we've heard from students um, or our own intuition that these things are happening, we tell them that that you know you, it's it's on you to to be the change. Um, <clears throat> and um, with regards to race and ethnicity, there is a well documented history of you know activism um, with with Columbia and kind of students fighting back to see um, programming and et cetera um, around like um, diversity issues as well as like a variety of other things. And I think that the university has somewhat come to expect, in my opinion, has someone come to expect that that's the response of students? And so I don't think that it has the, the type of impact that it is. I think it's taken for granted. Um, and I think that this is really harmful for marginalized individuals. And I say individuals that, because it's not just kind of students who are on the forefront of fighting for you know, more inclusive spaces, but, but also staff and, and faculty and, and um, those um, who are in those positions um, and are, are marginalized identities are also kind of impacted by, um, <clears throat> by this um, way of organizing. Um, but this is really harmful for individuals, whether, whether it be staff, professors, or students, because in addition to their jobs, there's also a psychological and physiological tax on um, them <laughs> um, because while they're trying to while e each of these individuals are very eager students um, faculty staff they're very eager to see that change and if they have that opportunity they're going to hop on it however um, they, it's hard for them to both do that and manage their careers, manage their studies, and, and this at the same time. And so I think that just because students are eager and they protest and, and faculty and they, they make these kind of dis, these dissents, um, that, that shouldn't be the kind of way in which we um, we expect them to make change, right? It should be, institutions should be more um, pre uh, proactive. Um, putting the burden on marginalized individuals is both unethical and sustainable, and unsustainable. And the university must be more proactive in its, um, in its actions and its orientation. Um, and in, with regards to my research, um, I, think, um, I think about how schools respond to trauma and, um, and the implicit ways in which they stratify kids based on a whole host of traumatic experiences. And I see a similar parallel um, in higher education at Columbia, whereby schools have a, uh, what is perceived to be a lackluster response to traumatic experiences. Um, in, in the case of Columbia, we can kind of all note, like you know, sexual assault and other kind of racial um, racial incidences here on campus. And students um, not only have to kind of process that trauma, but they have to um, and work through it. But they also must do the hard work of mobilizing um, to let the university know that their responses have been inadequate to, to the actions or to, to how they felt. Um, so there becomes a highly stratified way in which marginalized students, um, staff, and professors experience Columbia versus other students. And I think the university should be well aware, aware of that. And so I think that that's the kind of parallels that, that my research has to, to this. And um, just on a, a couple of final notes in terms of thinking about what this means for me, it's put me in an interesting space in, in terms of thinking about like my career as a as a as a as a um 
professor eventually um, and, and, and being a student um, at this current moment um, is that um, if, if I'm interacting or talking with my students or even in my own experience, um, there's a, a keen awareness of the, the kind of latent police of policing of knowledge. Um, and we, we hear that from our students' experiences when they're talking about um, their classrooms and their, their interactions with professors and students when, when taking um, classes within the core. But even for my own self in terms of thinking about, you know, what does it mean for me to be a sociologist of color and to be thinking about theory and um, in some of my classes being told, well, you know, that's a sidebar. Like, you know, well, then how do I see myself as a sociologist of color or somebody who studies race when um, there's a policing of the particular knowledge that I'm able to display and put on the table? Um, and so I think that the university has to be better about um, re, um, understanding all of the identities that are present in a classroom. How do we have more inclusive syllabuses? Um, how do we think about incorporating all um, students um, in, into these spaces? Um, and there's also um, a tension on what, um, there, I feel the tension of what it feels like to be a burden because you know the few professors of color that are here on the campus um, are taxed in ways that make them unable to um, to give you the type of attention that you would like. Um because you know that they have like all of this other research and work and, and that it's a type of um, physical labor that isn't necessarily rewarded by the institution. So I think it puts students of color or marginalized students in this kind of unique space of feeling like they are a burden. And I think that the university needs to recognize that um, and, and attend to that. Um, and so you know, on, on that note, I'll just kind of wrap up and say that I think that, the, that, the, that some of the main things that the university could do to move forward is kind of thinking about how do we create a central office of diversity or a space in which we can kind of bring all of these kind of disjointed offices that are doing work and doing great work together um, and that there be some type of accountability on, on that at, at, at the higher um, levels of, of the university and also kind of paying attention to how do we make our classes um, more inclusive in terms of like syllabuses and knowledge. Thank you very much. I'm going to come to Hilda next. Yeah. Thank you. So we have in our midst a certified Columbia Pathbreaker, um, first African American woman to be on the faculty of uh, the, the be in the uh, obstetrics and gynecology program, the medical school at Columbia, and now she's been working in recent years as a catalyst for change at physicians and sur surgeons, developing pop pipelines for students of color and underrepresented students. So I wanted to ask you, what are the challenges to entry in the medical world? world in specific, um, in particular, related to race and ethnicity. How have you seen uh, students, the students that you so successfully have brought here for many years, successfully navigate and confront the challenges that, they're, that are generated um, when they come to Columbia? And given your historic role in transforming and diversifying the student population at PNS, how have you fostered community among this diverse population of students once they arrive? Well, thank you for the invitation to speak about what we're doing up at the Medical Center. And with those questions, I could speak for an hour. So I decided I, I'd take some notes just to keep me on track. I tend to run off and start talking about a little bit of everything. Um, last evening, my daughter, who is a student here, sent me links to some articles in The Spectator. Um, and she told me to pay particular attention to the comments that were made at the end. And I read those comments and tears came to my eyes. And I literally had to climb into my bed and try to go to sleep. I think I'm the oldest one on here. I grew up in Tuskegee, Alabama, in the last decades of the Tuskegee experiment, where my family knew black men who were part of this experiment. I grew up in the turbulent 60s in Alabama with George Washington, not George Washington, George Wallace. <laughs> <laughs> as our governor in a segregated town. I was one of the first students, black students, to integrate the public schools in my town. So I lived through a lot of racism. I've had spit thrown my way. I've been called every name except the child of God. 
by people and, and, and racism was just a, a part of daily life. I thought we'd gone past that. Um, I left Tuskegee and I went to Stanford University um, where students, other students, constantly question, how did you get here? And why are you here? The word affirmative action came up quite frequently. Um, it, and it's, I think it's still difficult for, for minority students today, especially those who are pre-med, to be in an amphitheater of 300 students and look around and you're the only person of color. Or maybe there's another one. And as you move higher up in the sciences, you feel isolated, marginalized. And people are constantly questioning, why are you here? And how did you get here? Um, I went from Stanford, I worked really hard. I got into Harvard Medical School and people would sit next to me and say, oh, she just got in because of affirmative action. You know, nobody questioned, well, what was your MCAT score? Or what was your GPA? Um, they made assumptions about my intelligence. And that continued at Harvard Medical School. Um, I finished Harvard and I came to Columbia and I was the first African American female resident. Um, the faculty was 99% white males. And again, people said, where did you come from? I came from Harvard. <laughs> But that only seemed to make them angry. <laughs> you know, how did I get into Harvard? Um, and it was difficult. It was trying. And there were times when I wanted to give up. But I remember what my mom said. She said, you know, there will always be racism. People will always judge you by the color of your skin. At least some people will. And you have to let that just roll off your back like a duck in water. She said, you see a duck, it dips down, it comes up and is dry. It just lets the water roll off the back. And those are her exact words. Um, she said, if you know inside yourself that you're a good person, that you're a hardworking person, and that you're deserving of everything that you work hard for, then you will be successful. And I always remember that, and I tell that to my medical students when they come in because I think it's, it goes beyond complaining about racial slights. At some point, even though we want in, a, in, a, in an educational setting, in an institution of higher learning, we want to provide safe spaces for our students so that they can say whatever comes to their minds. But it, I think it's equally important to give skills on how to navigate, navigate life when you leave this institution. Racism is never going away. Not in my lifetime, and certainly not in yours. There will always be people who will judge you by the color of your skin, by your ethnicity, by your sexual orientation, your disability, your age, et cetera. And so I think another thing that we need to do in an in a institution of higher learning and education is to provide skills for students um, along the way. So when I, um, I knew that I wanted to be in, in, in uh, higher ed because I wanted to make a difference for young people who, especially young people of color, who are constantly told that they don't belong and that they're not as good and that they're only here because of affirmative action. So I, um, I joined the faculty and then the dean at the time uh, gave me the job of associate dean and he said I want you to increase the number of underrepresented minority students at Columbia Medical School. 
which sounded like it would be a lot of fun and not so difficult to do. But when you look at the numbers in the last 40 years, the number of black and Latino and native students in medical school has not increased significantly. Can you imagine 40 years, no progress. Um, and so what we decided to do is we had to grow our own minority students. So we have a number of pipeline programs at Columbia. We have pipeline programs for, medical, for middle school students, for high school, for college students. Um, in any given year, we have over 300 underrepresented minority and disadvantaged students that pass through the medical center receiving academic enrichment, encouragement, given skills, given knowledge, because if you're the first in your family to go to college, the first in your family to go to medical school, there's so many things that you don't know that everybody else knows. Mm -hmm. So our job is to provide that uh, knowledge to the students. Um, we encourage our students to, to speak out and our also president, Black and Latino Student Organization president is here. Um, we do encourage them to, to speak out um, because I think it's important that students have a voice. And it is our responsibility as faculty and leaders to listen. And by that I mean actively listen to what students have to say and to honor their experiences, to validate their experiences without excuses. So one of the things that the dean did was um, he asked us to do a number of different focus groups with our minority students. And the kinds of experiences that I was told about, again, brought back those memories that I thought were long gone. Um, some of the experiences, like being asked, what are you? What does that mean? What are you? And students have said, uh, you know, I wanted to say human, mm -hmm. but I knew they were talking about my race or my ethnicity. So there are lots of things still going on, even in the medical school. Um, these focus groups then gave a report to the dean, who um, I have to give him a lot of credit, was very angry. And he has put together groups that um, are charged to making a difference. He has said that, you know, if he has to fire somebody, he will fire them. <laughs> Faculty who are found guilty of, of uh, mistreatment. <clears throat> Um, he's also talked about a little bit of having uh, sensitivity training and whatever. But um, I think we at the medical center, we're very, very fortunate to have a leader who views these issues as being extremely important and is actively looking to do something um, about it. And the other thing I'll mention, since I'm also president here, is that our students uh, are very active in all the national movements, uh, the Black Lives Matter, White Coats for Black Lives, and just today they had an event to talk about what's happening at Yale and Missouri, um, which was, was absolutely wonderful. We have lots of other supports at the medical center. Um, we have an Office of Student Wellness. We have a mental health service that's head by an African-American woman. Um, students are encouraged to go to those two, um, into those two um, sites and to talk about the experiences that they're having as well as, as my office. So there's lots of good things going on up at, at the Medical Center and thank you for allowing me to share. Thank you very much. So Roosevelt, I'm going to... Roosevelt, I'm going to come to you next. Okay, um, so I think you have the distinction of being the only one up here with three Columbia degrees. So you bring the perspective from having been at this institution a long time. So you've seen some change, probably you know, good change for good, change for bad. You also bring uh, a, a unique sort of vantage as a scholar because you're a scholar of the history and cultural literatures of slavery and abolition, and you also are the director of the Center for the Core Curriculum. So. 
I wanted to ask you, what insights does this, your background and your history offer into the reasons for the current foment on campus? And I think for the people who might not be familiar with Columbia College, what is the core curriculum? Um, and for what folks might know about the core curriculum, if they don't know a lot about it, is that there tends to be a lot of white guys in it. And, um, and uh, what, what would you have to say about that? Is this the right curriculum for these times? And is there room for change? Great. Thank you. Um, thank you, Alondra, and thank you, Suzanne, for inviting me to be here. I feel honored to be up here with um, the, the rest of you. Um, thank you all for the work that you do. Um, you know, I, I find that we are we're in a really important and exciting moment. Um, there is a kind of awakening happening, and, and this, this, I think this movement that brings us all here together is essentially a movement for accountability. Um, you know, last year there was a, a lot of thinking and a lot of activism around issues of sexual violence that actually triggered important changes, and I think raised the conversation and raised the consciousness. Um, and something like that is going on now. Um, and I, I'm feel inspired by it. Um, as Alondra said, I've been at Columbia a long time. I've seen a lot of changes, a lot of movements, a lot of evolution, um, and I've never experienced a, a groundswell of concern and engagement like this. Um, to, you, to, to your question, Alondra, one of the things that my scholarly background sheds light on is uh, the issue of race and slavery in the United States. Race, racial slavery is the central trauma of this society. And the politics of today, the major debates and the major polarization and the forces that have made our political systems sclerotic and apparently unable to move forward are all rooted in the Confederacy versus the North and are rooted in the history of racial slavery in the United States. It is our central trauma. And the conversations that we have today and the problems that we are dealing with are rooted in that. Um, and, and it's it sheds light on the fact that, you know, when someone today says, I'm not a racist, I don't have racist beliefs, I am not responsible for your issues, um, it's, it's missing the point. We live in a society that has been shaped by racism, a, an economy that was built on slave labor camps. And you cannot grow up in this society without assimilating racist views, without assimilating unconsciously normative ways of seeing the world that are racist. So part of what's exciting about this conversation is that, it is, is that it, it's issuing a challenge for us to look within ourselves and try to understand and become conscious of the ways in which this legacy of racism shapes the way we see the world and shapes our institutions. Um, and that is, I think that's, that's what we must ask of ourselves. And, and I should clarify that it's not just, a, it's not this implicit racism I'm talking about, it's not just something that, that white people have. Everybody that grows up in this society has that. And that, you know, when, when a minority when a, uh, the object of oppression, of racial oppression, internalizes those racist views. That's, that's what the boys call the double consciousness. When you see yourself through the eyes of the oppressor, and that stuff gets into you. Um, it becomes part of the way that you construct your self-understanding. Um, so this is, a, I think, a really important moment um, in our national life and life of the institutions. Um, the core curriculum, for those of you who, who don't 
No, it's a set of courses required of all Columbia undergraduates. Um, courses in literature and philosophy, in art. There's a course in science that's new, um, or newish. Um, these courses are all taught in small sections in seminar. They all have a common curriculum, so the students are exposed to the same works in literature, philosophy. Um, it is a historical approach, that is, the courses are organized chronologically, so that you begin from some of the most ancient texts, and you move chronologically forward to the present. Um, the core curriculum is central to the experience of being a Columbia student and pervades the conversations in every classroom and in every faculty, even people who are not at Columbia College and who do, who do the curriculum. It, it has such a mark on the intellectual culture of the place. And it is therefore also a site of conversation and a site of dispute, a site of debate. And it is one of the best functions of the core. Um, we have a space around which to debate fundamental issues. Um, and the core has always been self-questioning. It has been, from the beginning, a place where we bring our understanding of what matters and what is the best kind of education that we need to be effective actors in today's world. Um, It always changes. One of the common misconceptions about the core is that it is a permanent, eternal, unchanging list of books that you read. Um, it is not. In fact, every three years, both the Litham and the CC syllabus are reviewed. Changes are implemented. So the, co the, the course evolves. What, so the course is always changing. What does not change is the past. I know that some people say that historians can change the past, but it's actually not true. Not even historians can change the past. We can change the way we understand the past, but the core functions on the premise that we are most effective in making interventions in the present by having an understanding of how the present emerged from the past. Um, you know, we have Aristotle. Every sophomore reads Aristotle in CC. Well, here's a guy who lived a long time ago who was pretty smart, who had a tremendous impact in the development of the way that we think about the world, our institutions, politics, science. Well, that guy believed that some people were natural slaves, that there were some people that were, that were such that their natural place was to be enslaved. Well. That line of thinking, that doctrine, that understanding of hierarchy in society and among humans becomes centuries later one of the justifications for the enslavement of peoples, for the subjugation of, say, native peoples in the new world explicitly, that understanding. Well, that's the past. That is, that happens. We owe a lot of great things to Aristotle. We, we owe some terrible things to Aristotle. But our understanding of those things needs to grapple with that fact. Needs to grapple with the influence, the trajectory of that. Um, so because of this historical commi commitment of the core to go as far back as we have texts and move forward, the history, the syllabus of the core reflects the history of power, of subjugation, of racism, of oppression that characterizes the West. Why don't we have women in the first half of Lidham and CC? Well, we do have currently a female writer in the first half of Lidham, but why don't we generally? Because women were systematically excluded from the tools of intellectual production. And a glaring story that that syllabus tells is that, is the history of power, the history of exclusion. It is there, and we have to understand it, we have to grapple with it, and we have to understand that where we are today emerges from that. But you know what's also there? There is a history of arguing for equality and for social justice. There is a history of arguing against oppression and for justice, that is also there. 
and the historical movements for social justice and for the dismantling of oppressive structures have their ideological roots there. Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and Frank Fanon and Michel Foucault and Mahatma Gandhi were rooted in that tradition and emerged and, and, and uh, deploy that tradition for liberatory purposes. So, um, a site for debate, a site for us to um, think about how the world today is shaped, um, and to be constantly revising our understanding um, of that past. Thank you, Roosevelt. So, Dina Kino, I'm going to come to you next, actually. I'm going to end with, uh, with Nisi, because I think it's the best way to open our speak out, actually. Okay, how do you feel? Is that okay, Nisi? I'm perfectly fine. You feel, I, I thought you might be okay with that. Okay. <laughs> so, um, Melinda, can you say a little bit about your work as the Dean of Multicultural Affairs and what that entails? And I wanted to ask you from your perspective as an administrator and one who works closely with students, what changes do you see that could be made to create a more inclusive club? Columbia community. Great. Thank you, Alondra. Uh, and thank you also because I see a lot of the students that we work with every day and that's helped shape our office in the audience. So we want to just acknowledge the work that they've done and work with us in making the what's possible in, in my role. I think as um, Dean of Multicultural Affairs working with our undergraduate students, at the core of what I do and I think with a very committed and passionate staff um, that I get a privilege of working with is first and foremost listening. Because I think so much of what I hear with our students, whether it be in a small group dialogue or in a large speak out like this, is that their experiences are invalidated in many ways as they navigate the institution or silenced um, in the way that there's an inability to really share what that impact has been on them. And so providing spaces for students to come together to be able to share those really difficult moments and find that support amongst each other is something that I'm really proud that we're able to help facilitate. I think just as important also is really listening developmentally where all our students are. Um, the work of multicultural affairs, while I think a critical and important part of our work in really thinking about the how complicated intersectional identities are and how it plays out on our campus and helping support marginalized students in many different ways is also really um, putting to the community what is the responsibility of all students in making sure that responsibility doesn't solely rest on the um, shoulders of students of color or queer and trans students or low income students, but there's a shared accountability that everyone needs to have. Um, I think beyond listening is also then translating that into both action within our office, but making sure that OMA is not the only space doing the work. Uh, we had a meeting earlier, because I'm, OMA is part of a larger area called undergraduate student life, which is comprised of residential life and student engagement. We had a conversation at our, our, our monthly meeting this morning, and um, Dean Crom, who's in the audience today, she started it off with sharing a timeline of what happened at Yale and Missouri, count, recounting incident after incident after incident, institution after institution after institution. And just visibly like scanning the room among my colleagues, you could see people's shoulders start slumping. And one of the questions that I kind of put out to the group is, that's really heavy, just to hear everything over and over again. But what does that even mean for somebody who has to live that day after day after day, whether it be in the life that they have leading up into their moment at Columbia or every day as they in, uh, navigate the institution. And so part of my role within the OMA is I think we have wonderful resources in really intellectualizing what structural and institutional racism is, both in society and at Columbia. But I think what the heart of my role is, is also thinking about how is it lived every day and what is our responsibility, whether it be in undergraduate student life or um, with my colleagues um, that are on the panel, um, but everybody that it has to be a shared responsibility. Uh, I started at Columbia in 2005 and 
uh, it was right when the office was created. Exciting moment last year, we celebrated our 10th anniversary of the OMA. But if you think about, it's been 10 years in a 250 plus year institution. Mm -hmm. And I think part of what we need to acknowledge in thinking about what is a moment like this with that's happening at Yale and Missouri is not just a reminder of what we need to do. And I think there is, in reflecting what the, uh, my fellow panelists have said, it's an important and powerful moment. But it's also a moment to understand that it's not new. Um, I'm very grateful to the student activists because that's how I have a job here. Um, in 2004, there were a number of incidences that had happened from an affirmative action bake sale to um, Organite to um, a racist cartoon in a pu campus publication that mocked, um, it was then called Black Heritage Month. That led to a series of demands put to the institution saying we need a centralized space to do this work. It can't be just students. And so I'm very grateful for that movement. And it was actually with a number of faculty in the Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race and in an IRS that really helped propel the, propel the office as well. But you know, two years later, after the office was created, incidents continued. There was a movement called Shock, Stop Hate on Columbia's campus, that after a number of other incidents that had happened, called out to the institution, there's great that there's movement, there's change, but we need more. These incidents are still happening. The, the trauma that our students of color, um, particularly um, our LGBT students are feeling, particularly in those moments and that what those incidents indicated, they're still happening. <laughs> so again, incremental and slow movement. A number of things have changed. We were able to ha bring on um, a, a position that helped us really think about queer and trans issues on our campus, um, within our office after that moment. We we're able to expand to play um, our um, Intercultural Resource Center, which has been an important and powerful space for many of our undergraduate students. But then a year later, incidents continue to happen. And that's where in 2007, we had a hunger strike uh, around this time of year in that, in that moment. Again, a number of incidences that talk from curricular matters to experiences in the classroom to things that had happened. So it was constant reminders that change is happening, things are happening, but there's something at the root of the institution that we're not addressing. And I think Having a panel like this is really powerful because I think it's an opportunity to publicly acknowledge that there are serious um, commitments and ways and strides that we should be proud of in the ways that we promote social justice, but there's still things that are broken. And um, I think in thinking about what we need to do moving forward is, I mean, there's places where I think there should be that central um, place of accountability, but also acknowledging that it can't be just an OMA and it can't be just a centralized office. It has to be the shared responsibility of everyone. You know, from leadership of the university to the student who sits next to you in your lit home class, there's an accountability in terms of understanding how actions and decisions can impact, marginalize, silence the person next to you um, because of actions and decisions to even as the most well-intentioned um, action can be, but taking accountability when those actions lead to something else um, that's harmful and hurtful to a community. <laughs> so um, I want to be make sure that Nisi has important um, a, um, platform as well because I think she and many other folks in this room have important stories for all of us to hear. So, but thank you. Thank yeah. you. So we'll hear from Nisi, and then let's just go straight into the speak out. And um, you know, as people, as many people want to speak, you know, please do. We'll pass the mics around. Please identify your location. You know, if you're the medical center or the college, or um, and if you want to say your name, because we're trying to create community, that would be nice too. Um, before she begins, I just want to acknowledge what it means to be a college senior and to sit in this room with all of these people. This is the work that we're talking about that students of color do, and I want to just. Um, honor and acknowledge that about Nisi before she speaks. And um, the questions I had for you, you know, are, you know, what would it take for you to flourish here? And how can we, how can we create a setting that allows you to flourish? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that affirmation. It means a lot. Um, so before I actually begin, I want to say that I 
didn't write notes for this um, for two reasons. One, I sat down this morning and said, oh, the panel's tonight. Let me try to jot some things down. And I tried, and I was like, Lord, I'm so tired. I can't do this. <laughs> um, so that's my level of exhaustion. I don't want to begin my day thinking about how this institution has hurt me. Second was, I have been trained to write in such a way that my voice is limited. And that is something that this institution has done to me, which is something I will talk about um, in a second. And I say this disclaimer, and I see it as a disclaimer, not because I want to create a safer space for me. It's because I don't want anyone in this room to view me as less than when I use vernacular and when I say slang words or things that are of the youth. And that is also something that this institution has done to me. Um, so to begin, this institution and getting through it is hard. And that is a word we're told we're not supposed to use. We have to use these bigger words. We have to explain it and qualify it. Columbia in, is unnecessarily hard for black students, unnecessarily hard for students of color, unnecessarily hard for queer students, LGBTQ community, um, lower income students, students dealing with mental health. And then when you put all the intersections of that together, it is we can't get through. I started Columbia September 2010. I was accepted as the class of 2014. I will not receive my degree until 2016, if that is to any marker of how hard it has been for me to get through this institution. We operate in this university as bodies, and I feel that the university sees us as just bodies. And I believe that is shown through not only the curriculum that we are first to go through, but also in the ways that Columbia treats the black bodies that surround its institution. What is going on in Harlem and how Columbia relates to Harlem is a problem. Um, but dealing specifically with student life, Constantly and consistently, Columbia uses black bodies to promote its aims and its values that they tell us that they were founded on, but continuously forget to listen to us, actively silences our voices. And that is through the core. That is through the fact that it is so hard for student groups to get recognition. It's hard for us to get money. We're dealing with strange things. Um, our professors have no, professors that actually support us do not have support from the university. Um, uh, we are in classrooms where we are tired. We don't want to go to class. We have to decide whether, do I go to class today or take care of myself, which should never be an option. Um, and these are all things that add to this culture of what makes it so hard. And it's we cannot have quick fixes, which is what happens continuously and constantly. Um, it wasn't mentioned, but I'm a peer educator with sexual violence response. and. That was a quick fix that we went through last year. And it's hard, and we can't, dealing with race and structural racism, we can't have quick fixes. We had a quick fix last year at this time where under community gathering, nothing happened at that meeting. We had nothing happened at that meeting. Um, we had administrations, administrators turn their backs at us and the first time they spoke it was to criminalize us because we were out there talking about how we actually felt. That is a problem that is unnecessary. It should not happen. Yesterday I was in Art Hum. I hate Art Hum. I was in Art Hum and five times the word primitive was used in relation to Congolese art. And I had to decide, am I going to speak up and be that black person or am I going to stay quiet? I stayed quiet because it was already a hard day because students that live in my house were already dealing with too much and I couldn't take it. So I listened to the word primitive in relation to art that relates to my culture. Lit hum, okay, okay, the core. <laughs> It is always hard to hear about the core. And one of the things that I did last year, I worked a lot with OMA um, to have these discussions surrounding Lit Hum and CC, I think, was the main, were the main focuses. And I continuously just don't understand the rationale behind the core and why these texts are taught. And I, and I hear you, but I don't understand you. <laughs> And I don't think you understand me when I say that it is traumatizing to sit in core classes. Um, 
it, it's this idea that yes, the Western world was shaped by these powers, but that does not mean that I did not exist. So when we learn about it today, that does not mean I do not exist. There is no reason why we are talking about the natural slave without bringing it to this nation that was founded on slavery, bring it to this institution that was founded on slave labor. Please never let that be lost, and I want professors to talk about that. Um, the idea that history cannot be changed, in my view, is hard because history, if history was completely accurate, it would not be this question of can we change it. Um, and that we're looking at history through the lens of these powerful white men, and I have no power or agency as a black woman, so where do I fit in? I think the way activists on campus are treated is extremely harmful. Activists do a lot of work. Student activists do a lot of work. Black students do a lot of work on this campus, and it's to the point was where it's like, maybe you should pay me for what all I do, <laughs> because... I was brought up by seniors in this institution. I don't know how I would have got through freshman year without seniors. I don't know how I would have gotten through my sophomore year. Sophomore year, Trayvon Martin happened, Troy Davis Martin happened, and the seniors were the ones opening the space, the X Lounge. Thank God for the X Lounge, because I don't know how we would have survived. And I'm in my fifth calendar year, and I have so many first years that I like took under my wing last year, because I could not imagine what it would feel like to be a 17, 18 year old coming onto this institution where they have to choose, do I stay stay home or do I go to lit home where we are being ignored? And that is the problem. So we can talk about ideologies all day long, but in the, on, in the real world, I'm suffering and these traumatic experiences are not being addressed at all. And what does that mean that the university does not address these um, traumatic experiences? And when they do address the traumatic experiences, it's quick fixes or it's damaging. I don't need a paragraph email telling me to accept <laughs> oppressive and dangerous speech, because that oppressive and dangerous speech is why I cannot get up in the morning. So I need just... I need offices to be better. I need the offices of the deans to actually talk to us, the offices of the president to actually talk to us. We have all these pro, these all these reactionary events, and it's like, but what's happening? I'm wondering too, and I don't wanna, I think this has been a wonderful event, but it was planned in probably like four days, four or five days, and last year it took us 18 days to get a community gathering that did nothing. So I'm wondering what's different now that this is happening. I'm wondering in the space that's been set up. It's at a time where a lot of undergrads are still in class. Um, it's in the craft center, which a lot of black and brown students do not feel safe in. Um, and I'm the only undergrad on the panel. And so it's just a lot of things like, care needs to be taken when dealing with these issues and I think this has been a wonderful event and I'm super souped to be next to all these people because uh, things have been said by people that I never hear in um, university sanctioned events. Um, but that is not to say that we are not without problems or this event is not without problems. Um, and moving forward, how can we continue to be better? Um, one of those things is continuous check-ins with these communities, these marginalized communities. I hear a lot about deans meeting with students, um, but these are students that are saying, yes, Columbia, I love Columbia, roar, lion, roar. <laughs> if that's what these students are saying, you do not need to be talking to them at all because they are not the ones making sacrifice to exist within this space. I am, so what are you doing to help me? What are you doing to talk to the athletic team, say, no, you can't put basketballs in your shorts. That is offensive and that is derogatory. And these are continuous instances that are happening and we're continuously give, given statements and no action. I wanna see the OMA supported tenfold. OMA should be their own department without being under student life. That's how much they do for us. IRAS, CSER, Institute of African Studies, they should all be departments. That's how much their professors do for us. I need the university to acknowledge the people who are actually doing for us and listen to them. Because if you have a problem listening to me with my vernacular and the way I speak, maybe you'll listen to them. 
However, my voice is very important, and I acknowledge that as well. <laughs> Thank you, Nisi. Thank you all.